Oklahoma is the land of second, third, and last chances. Who were the people that made it so? We'll trace the golden threads they've woven through Oklahoma history. The Red River Institute and Atwoods present Oklahoma Gold. I'm Gwen Falconer Lippert, along with award-winning author and Southern Nazarene University historian John J. Dwyer. We'll dig for the golden nuggets of Oklahoma history here now on Oklahoma Gold. Golden Beyond Gold. John J. Dwyer, tell me their story. Gwen, you know, we just passed another Veterans Day observation in this country, which is one of the, the great dates of our annual calendar. And I thought it'd be appropriate for us to remember those who have sacrificed for our country, sometimes sacrificed everything. So I'm excited to uh, share the stories on this episode of Oklahoma Gold of two courageous Vietnam War veteran Oklahomans. First up is Fallis, Oklahoma native and Oklahoma City Douglas High School graduate Riley Pitts. One of those names that most of us haven't heard of, but we need to. He won the Silver Star and numerous other decorations in Vietnam. He was a career soldier in the U.S. Army. He also graduated from Wichita State University, worked for Boeing Aircraft before enlisting in the Army in 1960. Subsequently married his wife, Eula, and sired a daughter named Stacy and a son named Mark. He was assigned to Company C, 2nd Battalion, 27th Infantry, 25th Infantry Division, and he began a 12-month tour in Vietnam near the end of 1966, six years into his career. Just one month before shipping home at the end of that tour, he made an astounding impact on a fierce series of battles in South Vietnam. They took place near Ap Dong in South Vietnam on October 31st, Halloween Day, 1967, between the U.S. Army and the North Vietnamese Communists. And no less than President Lyndon B. Johnson presented a citation for Pitts to his wife and children in person in the Oval Office of the White House in Washington, D.C. And the citation that President Johnson presented to Riley Pitt's family, I think, tells the story of his exploits as well as it could be told. And now I'm going to quote the words of President Johnson. Captain Riley Leroy Pitts distinguished himself by exceptional heroism while serving as company commander during an air mobile assault. Immediately after his company landed in the area, several Viet Cong opened fire with automatic weapons. Despite enemy fire, Captain Pitts forcefully led an assault, which overran the enemy positions. Shortly thereafter, Captain Pitts was ordered to move his unit to the north to reinforce another company heavily engaged against a strong enemy force. As Captain Pitts' company moved forward to engage the enemy, intense fire was received from three directions, including fire from four enemy bunkers, two of which were within 50 feet of Captain Pitts' position. The severity of the incoming fire prevented Captain Pitts from maneuvering his company. His rifle fire proving ineffective against the enemy due to, to dense jungle foliage, he picked up an M79 grenade launcher and began pinpointing the targets. Seizing a Chinese communist grenade, which had been taken from a captured Viet Cong's web gear, Captain Pitts lobbed the grenade at a bunker to his front, but it hit the dense jungle foliage and rebounded right back at him. Without hesitation, Captain Pitts threw himself on top of the grenade, which fortunately failed to explode. President Johnson continues in his citation. Captain Pitts then directed the repositioning of the company, just moving right on, to permit friendly artillery to be fired. Upon completion of the artillery fire mission, Captain Pitts again led his men toward the enemy positions, personally killing at least one more Viet Cong. The jungle growth still prevented effective fire to be placed on enemy bunkers. Captain Pitts, displaying complete disregard for life and personal safety, quickly moved to a position which permitted him to place effective fire on the enemy. He maintained continuous fire, pinpointing the enemy's fortified positions while at the same time directing and urging his men forward. 
until he was mortally wounded. Captain Pitt's conspicuous gallantry, extraordinary heroism, and intrepidness at the cost of his life, above and beyond the call of duty, are in the highest traditions of the U.S. Army and reflect great credit upon himself, his unit, and the armed forces of his country. And that's where President Johnson's citation to Riley Pitts to his, his family in the Oval Office of the White House ends. And Pitts's radio operator told his widow, Eula, that it took a direct hit to her husband's chest with a rocket-propelled grenade to finally bring him down. His brother Willard credited Douglas High School here in Oklahoma City, their staff and coaches, people like Coach Moses Miller, the football coach, with helping instill the values that forged Riley's character. It's a reflection of what went on here at Douglas High School, Willard said. There were many heroes and sheroes here at Douglas, helping the youngsters of the community to do the kinds of things that they did. Well, Gwen, since we're celebrating two Oklahoma heroes of the Vietnam War in this program, I don't want to shortchange Riley Pitts, so how about we have two golden nuggets today? And here's the one for Captain Riley Pitts of Oklahoma City. This is a moment touched with sorrow and splendor, President Lyndon Johnson said, as he presented Pitts's wife, Eula, and children, Stacy and Mark, with their father and husband's Medal of Honor. That's right, Riley Pitts of Oklahoma City won the first Medal of Honor ever awarded to an African American following his legendary deeds as a company commander in Vietnam. And as if to stamp a resounding exclamation point on how awe-inspiring Oklahoma's tradition of military valor is, fellow Oklahoman Reuben Rivers later became one of seven black World War II veterans belatedly awarded the Medal of Honor. He was a brave man and leader of men. President Johnson said of Riley Pitts, no greater thing could be said of any man. His valor under fire moved him forever into that select company where the heroes of our history stand. So Riley Pitts was the first African American? The very first in the entire country from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma City Douglas High graduate. And Gwen, I don't want to shortchange uh, our next hero of Oklahoma. And long before Buffalo Bob Kalsu became a starting lineman and rookie of the year for the Buffalo Bills, the name reflected his thundering stride and symbolized the six foot three, 250 pounders determined character. A beloved gentle giant in his native Dell City he became one of the greatest offensive linemen in OU football history and a cadet colonel and leader in the school's reserve officer training corps as well. He gave his word to serve on active duty should that call come, and in late 1968, it did. So Buffalo Bob Kalsu, Rookie of the Year for the Buffalo Bills, All-American for the Oklahoma Sooners before that, found himself, unlike other professional athletes, shipping off to Vietnam. In the middle of his football career, he shipped off. Oh, I want to hear this golden nugget. And what a special day to be honoring two incredible Oklahoma war heroes. This is Oklahoma Gold, the golden nugget, when we return. We're stitching the past to the present on Oklahoma Gold, and when golden is beyond gold, honoring our veterans. John J. Dwyer, tell me more. Buffalo Bob Kalsu, the great OU football American and rookie of the year but for the Buffalo Bills in the, the late 1960s is who we were talking about, shipping off to the Vietnam War at a time when all other professional athletes, at least nearly all of them, were sitting it out or going the reserve or guard route. When he got to Vietnam, casualties were soaring and public support had faltered. Nearly everyone he knew urged him to take one of the many outs that were offered to him. Buffalo Bob Kalsu's response, I gave him my word, I'm gonna do it. And do it he did. 
A few weeks before he left for Vietnam, his beloved wife Jan knelt with Bob Kalsu before the altar of Oklahoma City's St. James Catholic Church, where the two had wed. If you need him more than I do, she silently prayed to the Lord, please give me a son to carry on his name. Well, Kalsu was commissioned an artillery officer in the U.S. Army's legendary 101st Airborne Division, the Screaming Eagles. His letters to Jan and their baby daughter Jill from Vietnam were cheerful and loving, but Jan realized that they didn't convey the whole story during a week of R&R in Hawaii with Bob in May of 1970. He slept much of the time, but during one afternoon nap, fireworks erupted near the hotel pool. He tore out of that bed, frantic, looking for cover, Jan recalled, terror and fear on his face. I got a glimpse of what he was living through. Kalsu returned to a hell on earth in Vietnam. The U.S. government had once more sent thousands of brave, trusting men on a suicide mission. It was America's last big ground battle of the war. U.S. troops were already streaming home from Vietnam when the 101st went on the offensive against major North Vietnamese and Viet Cong operations around the Aishau Valley in South Vietnam. Airborne infantry scoured the nearby jungle to cut off enemy infiltration of Vietnam through the infamous Ho Chi Minh Trail. Lieutenant Bob Kalsu and the supporting 101st artillery units, meanwhile, based hundreds of feet above at the mountaintop redoubt named Fire Support Base Ripcord, a famous name in American military history, wreaked havoc on communist troops and supply lines as far as 13 miles away. Shaken enemy forces zeroed in on and gradually surrounded the American fortress. The deeply entrenched Reds bombarded the Yanks day and night. Kalsu took command of an entire battery when his superior officer was gravely wounded. Journalist William Knack mournfully recounted what happened next. And I quote here, as the NVA massed to attack Ripcord, the U.S. command in Vietnam decided not to meet force with more force, which would have put even more body bags on the evening news. So Ripcord was left twisting in the boonies, end quote. In other words, Bob Kalsu and his comrades were on their own. Numerous soldiers recalled that the Oklahoman was unlike any other officer they ever met, even as the massed communist forces moved in for the kill. Corporal Mike Renner, a gunner, recalled, and I quote again, he could have holed up in his bunker, but he was out there in the open with everybody else. He was always checking the men out, finding out how we were, seeing if we were doing what needed to be done. I got wounded on ripcord, and he came down into the bunker personally. My hands were bandaged, and he asked me, you want to catch a chopper out of here? I saw the bloody bandage on him. He'd been hit in the shoulder and saw he was staying. I said, no, I'm going to stay too. Other soldiers remembered Kalsu alone among the officers shouldering 100-pound shells, three at a time, up shrapnel shrieking hills to his guns. The American defender's language and behavior deteriorated to that of junkyard dogs due to the relentless horror, Renner remembered. But I never heard Lieutenant Kalsu cuss, not once. At 5 o'clock on the afternoon of July 21st, 1970, Bob Kalsu stood in the doorway of his bunker with another soldier. His face beaming with joy, he read aloud a letter from his wife. My wife's having our baby today. At that instant, an incoming mortar exploded, killing Kalsu and nearby soldiers. Only two days later, orders came to evacuate Ripcord. Surrounded, outnumbered nearly 10 to 1, and weathering a hail of small arms, mortar, and anti-aircraft fire, airborne evacuated. The enemy commander himself later admitted that the 101st had destroyed eight of his nine battalions. Meanwhile, two days later, a weeping army lieutenant informed hospitalized Jan of her husband's death as she held her newborn son, Bob Jr., in her arms. Her strong Christian faith has sustained her through all the years since. She remarried in 1988. Jill and Bob Jr., meanwhile, grew into honorable, respected adults with many of their own children. No one suffered more pain, though, than Bob Jr. And in his teenage years, he wrote this poem called, Why God? Why my father, God? What did he ever do? You didn't even give him time to tell his own son, I love you. The love he showed for others could have been for me, too. Why him, God? Was he just for you? Well, years later, Jan found a long-forgotten cassette tape Bob had mailed her from Vietnam shortly before his death, 
The gentle but manly Oklahoma drawl expressed his love for her and Jill, and it concluded, and now for you, baby K, Bob Jr., daddy loves you, and pretty soon I'll be home to hold you. Bob Kalsu, an Oklahoma veteran, and that's Oklahoma gold. <laughs>